Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Matt Pry, and I'm an entomologist with the New York State IPM program. Thank you for joining us today for our first Friday. Uh, the goal of these sessions is to help you prevent or manage pest problems using integrated pest management. Uh, and this is an approach that uses information about pest biology to reduce their populations and make areas less attractive to pests. So thank you for joining us today. Um, I just want to go over a few things about our Zoom that we'll be using uh, for our presentations today. And the first is that this event will be recorded um, and posted to our YouTube playlist. So we'll have that information after today's session. All attendees will be muted during today's presentation, but if you have a question, you can use the chat function, uh, which is typically located at the bottom of your screen. There's a little chat icon that you click which will open up a window and you can type your question to everyone in the group so that all can see your question and we can respond. Um, for any questions that we do not get to during today's presentation, we will answer those in the um, description or the details of the YouTube video. Um, and you can see an example of that here on the right-hand side, we have uh, links that were shared and questions that were not answered. Uh, closed captions are available today. If you'd like to use those, you simply press the CC button at the bottom of your screen. And at this time, um, I'd like to invite our first speaker to bring up their slides. Uh, our first speaker today is Dr. Diana Obregon. And Diana is a postdoctoral research associate with the New York State IPM program. Uh, in her role, Deanna works to develop and improve pest management practices that reduce risks to pollinators, beneficial arthropods, and native plants. Um, so today, Deanna will be talking about insects in your garden. So Deanna, you can take it away. Thank you, Matt. Um, so good day, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining today. So I'm going to take you to a super quick journey um, to show you some of the most common insects that you can find in outdoors plants, but also some of them could find in, could be found in indoor plants too. Um, okay. So insects are super diverse. Um, an expert said that there's about uh, 900,000 species reported by science but if we keep exploring we can we're going to find many many more species so it's hard to really identify all of them or be aware of all of them but if you pay close close attention to your garden to your plants and you uh, watch for specific behaviors or uh, morphological characteristics characteristics you may not know the name of the insect but you can tell what's the function or what's the relation of, that the insect is having with the plant so i have an example here so you see these pretty flowers and plants they like to attract some some particular insects so with with uh, with the flowers with the pollen with the nectar they like to attract pollinators um also herbivores are attracted to the leaf tissue to the stems because plants are rich in carbohydrates and other and, and other nutrients uh but when you have herbivores they are also attracting some other insects so for example parasitoids or predators uh, that can come to your to your plant so when you look at a plant and you see different insects just have in mind keep in mind that not all of them could be pests. Not all of them are herbivores. Some of them are beneficial and some are just playing different roles. So even for example, these um, syrphid fly, you can see that as an adult, they can be pollinators, but as larvae, this is the larvae of a, a hover fly, they like to eat aphids. So this is like the ideal insect to have in your garden. So if you see a syrphid fly, a hover fly, protect them and like uh, be happy that they are around. So yeah, my goal for the presentation is just to tell you, observe, observe, and observe, pay attention to the insects in your garden, what's their behaviors, are the, their behavior, what's the, how the plants look like, are they affected or not, um, how spread are the insects in the garden, because many, um, many insects, they like to live um, in uh, together gregarious so if you find them in a spot would be easier to control them um instead of like waiting for them to spread all over your garden 
So monitoring and, and, and really checking your plans constantly will help you help you a lot. And I won't have time to like show you all the beneficial insects, but we have, so Amara, our colleague, she produced an amazing hand pocket book that you can check. Um, so we're gonna share the link with you and you can see all the beneficial, not all, but many beneficial arthropods that you can um, find in New York. So I'm gonna focus on herbivores and I'm gonna start with the tiny ones because sometimes with the tiny ones, they you just don't notice them at the beginning or you can confuse them with other things. Um, so I wanna start with these three groups that are very related. So aphids, white flies, scales and mealybugs. They all belong to the same order, to Hemiptera, and they have pierce and suck, um, they pierce and suck the sap of the plants. Um, they all have a small and soft bodies. They can be vector of pathogens, so they can transmit viruses uh, or bacteria um, because they um, feed themselves with the sap of the plant. And the sap of the plant is very rich in, in carbohydrates. Um, they need to eat a lot to meet their protein requirements. So because they have to eat a lot, they excrete also a lot. And that excretion is um, a sugary liquid uh, that is called honeydew. And this honeydew can lead to other things that I'm, I'm, I'm gonna show you in a bit. Um, but um, I just wanted to put them together so you are aware that these three are hard to manage and hard to detect. Uh, but I'm gonna show you more about them. So aphids in particular, they, they are pear-shaped and they are usually wingless. They like to be underside the leaves. Uh, so you must not, you must, you maybe not see them until there are like many. Uh, they can be green, black, orange, red. Um, one distinct morphological feature that you can find is that they have something called cornicles. It, there, there are like two tiny structures at the end of their abdomen. And scientists are not in consensus of what they are used for, but it seems like they produce some volatiles to repel um, parasitoids. So it's like a way for them to defend. Uh, but it's a good feature to identify aphids. So if you see a bird shaped looking insect with these two like tiny horns in the back, they could be aphids. Um, and you can see them here in this picture, like piercing and sucking the, the leaves. Um, and because they like um, leaf buds, so like the small, the small leaves, they can lead to leaf malformation. They can also, um, as I said before, they can transmit viruses. So if you see a, a mosaic like this, this could be caused by a aphid that was transmitting a virus from plant to plant. Um, they also, as I said, they produce honeydew. So if you see some leaves that are like glossy and sticky, that might be honeydew produced by aphids or, or some of the other, these other insects that I just mentioned. And these honeydew can result in two things. So for example, they could attract ants. So ants like to like this honeydew and they treat the aphids like cattle, moving them around and like extracting their honeydew. And in exchange, they provide some um, defense mechanisms against like predators that can be like around. So ants will defend the aphids from, for example, ladybugs. And in this honeydew, this honeydew is very problematic because also it can lead to the growth of this uh, mold, the sooty mold. So this uh, mold does not penetrate the plant tissue, but it blocks the sunlight. So it's it's it can reduce growth. Um, and I wanted to show you like the ladybugs because they really like aphids. So if you see the adult, if you see the larvae that is here in this picture, protect them. And also if you see the eggs, this, the eggs are very like bright and like oval shape. Um, you want that to have in your in your plants. White flies. Uh, so white flies are not true flies. So people call them white flies, but they're not flies. Um, and they also like to live underneath the leaves. And you see this, the adult is white and it has like a triangular shape when you see them from the front. 
um, but the nymph are pretty real looking. So if you sometimes you just have nymph, and if you see them, you might think, oh, this might be, I don't know, a seed or it can be a fungi, but they're actually insects. So be aware of that. Uh, so here you can see the eggs, the nymph, the adults, and these two pictures are showing some of the damage that they can cause. So you see some malformation of the of the leaves, some like dead tissue, um, and also like some mold. Scales. Um, this is another problematic and, and rear looking insect. <laughs> So they like also the underneath of the plant, but they like to be close to the veins and also in the stems. So you can see them like aligned with the, with the veins. Um, they are very well protected with a wax coat and that makes them very difficult to manage with pesticides. So pesticides, pesticides in general, they don't penetrate this waxy coat. So it's not... Um, a very good idea to use pesticides in this case. Some soapy solutions might work because they like um, uh, interfere with the wax, with the fat, and, and can help to, to penetrate the, the insecticide. Mealybugs, um, they don't have a hard wax, but they have a soft wax that is usually in threads that you can see here. Um, this is an adult, so an adult a female adult that underneath has the egg masses. So they are all, again, pretty real looking. Um, so if you see this on the right top, um, this wide, it looks like a fungi. So you might get confused. So pay attention if they, and try to remove some of the wax so you can get a better idea of what actually you have. Some of them, they can affect the roots. So it's, you can see a plant that is just, um, getting like jello and wilt and you don't know why you can check the roots because you might be um you might have an attack by mealybugs. I include mites here. They are not insects. They're actually more related to spiders. So they have eight leg um eight legs. They have just one segmented some segmented body. And I wanted to include it here because the damage of the of the leaves they look pretty similar to wildflies, to aphids, and they're also very tiny. And one good sign to detect them are the spider webs. So if you see some spider web, they can produce that and you should be looking for mites. Um, and the damage that they produce in the plants, sometimes it looks like a, like a disease too. Uh, so the, the plants, the leaves tend to be like brownish, yellowish, and they could have the spider web. So that's that's something that you could look for. Um, moving on to like bigger bugs. Um, so I, we have here the plant tarnish bug. Um, you can see the nymph, the adult. This is um, an invasive species that attacked many plants, but they are very keen to like fruits, especially. So you can see the damage here in, in, in the strawberries. And they also like clover and alfalfa. So if you want to grow strawberries, for example, try to be um, try to remove the clover or alfalfa, alfalfa that you might have around. Um, there are some parasitoids. And so when this insect was detected here, um, there was the introduction of a parasitoid that do some biological control, but not enough. So you should be aware of that. Um, squash bugs, they mostly attack cucurbits, so squash, cucumber, um, pumpkins. Um, so with these ones, I uh, their eggs are very distinctive. They are like reddish, orangey, and they are very bright, and you can find them underneath or, or sometimes um, above. But if you remove them, you are like avoiding uh, for their damage. So it's, it's good to look for their eggs. These are the nymph on the right that you can also look for. Um, I wanted to include the sported lantern fly because um, maybe if you have been in other uh, of these sessions that you, you already talk about the sported lantern fly and that is an invasive species. And we are all looking out to detect their population. So if you see them in your garden, in the trees around you. And um, you can go to our website and check if the county where you live uh, 
already has the presence or not. And if it's not, you can report them. So you know there's like a task force in the, in the state to control their populations because they can be very, um, very bad for, for crops and for, for different um, trees. Leaf miner. So leaf miner is a common name for many insects, for many different insects that can be in different orders and different lifestyles, but they have in common that they like to make tunnels in the leaves. So what you are going to see is these white lines around, around your leaf tissue. And if you want to know if this is this can be confused with, I don't know, with a disease or with something else, you can just like try to remove part of the tissue, part of the layers of the of the leaves and look for the larvae or look for frost, the, the insect group. So in that sense, you can you can really know if this is an insect or other other problem that you may be having. Beetles, there's so many beetles that you can look for, but some of the common ones are the striped and spotted cucumber beetles. Um, they really like the first stages of the plant. So at the beginning, at, at the beginning of uh, when you're growing cucurbits, at the beginning is when you are really need to pay attention because they can be uh, very aggressive with your plants. Uh, the larvae also feed from the stem or or from the from the roots, so you can uh, you need to be aware of them. Um, you see on the right, on the top right, the Colorado the Colorado potato beetle, as the name. Uh, tell us they love potato, but they also love other plants that are in the same plant family, the Solanacea. So they like eggplant, tomatoes, um, yeah, they like all this, all these type of plants. And they can be really aggressive, but actually 70% of the damage is made by the larvae. You can see the larvae here on the right top. So be aware of the larvae. The larvae can be confused with a larvae of ladybugs. So uh, they, but the Colorado potato beetle are more, more like bigger and chunky. Um, but potato plants are actually good at tolerating some level of damage by these beetles. So there's some studies showing that uh, if the plant is in the vegetative state, they can tolerate um, until 30% of damage. So it's so if you see a few of them doing a little bit of damage, you still could have some, some harvest. So don't freak out right at the beginning. If you see one or two, give them a little bit of time. <laughs> Uh, and then there's a group of flea beetles. There's many different species of flea beetles. Um, they are called flea beetles because their hind legs are enlarged. And if you disturb the plants, they can jump like a flea. Uh, so that's a way to distinct them. Um, and their damage is also very particular. They make these like uh, dots, these round looking um, wounds that you can like spot. Um, in your garden. Caterpillars, um, there's, yeah, there's also many of them, uh, but what you have to know is that they eat a lot, right? And even at the beginning when they are, they, they tend to be gregarious and some of them, they can be, um, they can eat each other until they're just like few left that um, keep like eating and growing and growing. Um, so with this ones in a garden, I would recommend just like keep watching and like hand pick them and remove them with your hands from the from from your plant. That would be like the most effective way to 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 remove them, to control them. And also check for egg masses. So I'm making a lot of emphasis on egg because it, on eggs because if you remove egg masses, you are really controlling them at the very beginning where the damage could be none, right? So for caterpillars, because most of them are moth, um, the eggs that you have to be looking for, uh, they're usually aggregated, but they also have these stripes that you can, maybe you can see in this picture if the resolution, um, it's enough. So these, the, the egg masses of caterpillars are, they have some stripes that you can be looking for and that could be useful for you to know. Um, some other larvae that you can find that could be 
um, detrimental for your plants are the grubs of the Japanese beetle. So the adults are can you can easily recognize them and they make some damage, but the uh, the grubs can can affect the grass and you can start to see your grass to turn uh, yellow or dead and if you it, it's easily removed and you look for the roots you might find some uh, Japanese beetle uh, grass um okay so uh some strategies that you can use to control these populations on, on your gardens are First, as I said before, constant inspection of your plants. So just like looking, observing um, as often as, as you can. And be especially careful with the new plants that you bring because many plants that you buy in a nursery, um, in a store, they could bring pests, right? So, and don't just look at the leaves, but try to look at the, at the base of the stem or if you can take a little bit of a look on the, in the roots because you can bring many external pests just by buying new plants for your garden. So be aware of that. Also many, many nurseries and many, many stores, they use a lot of insecticides. So if you don't wanna use insecticides in your garden, you might be bringing insecticides to your garden just by buying uh, plants that have been heavily treated with insecticides and in that way affecting your beneficial insects. So, when you're buying plants, ask the people how this had been treated um, and, and what type of measures you, you use to control um, the pest. Also, you can handpick the insects or remove the damaged part, and, but be careful to not leave the things that you remove on the way, right? So you, need to, you might put them in ethanol or in soapy water or get rid of them, but be, don't leave them um, around in the garden. Uh, attract and protect beneficial insects, so encourage them to stick around by growing native flowers. So, for example, parasitoids, they really like to like uh, drink nectar from native flowers, so they will be around if you have more flowers. Uh, you can wash them out with insecticidal soap, so you can make just a combination of water and like pure soap, so soap that is uh, really made with fatty acids, not the detergent one or the dishwasher one. Um, and then you can combine that with garlic, with cayenne peppers, and always, of course, protect, protect yourself because not because it's like homemade, it's not fully safe. So always use gloves and, 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 be, and protect yourself. And um, keep your soil healthy and constantly water your plants because a plant that is in good condition, that is well nutrient, with good nutrients, it's gonna like thrive and be better defend against pests. And be aware also that the excess of fertilizers can benefit pests. So, if, for example, if you apply a lot of nitrogen, they can actually attract many herbivores. So that's that's something to have in mind. You can also use plant strong scented plants. Uh, like anise, chives, thyme that can that you can use at the edge to repel some of the insects. Uh, you can rotate your species and practice interplanting. And if these different techniques are not super successful, you can also use horticultural oils, botanical insecticides like. Uh, neem oil, pyrethrine, some microbiological insecticides like Bacillus thuringiensis that could work really well for caterpillars. Uh, but please always read the label and take all the all the follow all the recommendations. And we're gonna share also a blog where you can that can give you some um, tips to choose um, an insecticide that is not too bad for the beneficial insects. And another option, and finally, just let them be, right? Um, it's There's some estimation that about 50% of the pesticide that we use in the US is actually sprayed in gardens and in landscapes and like all these scenarios and not, and, and the other uh, half in agriculture. If we can reduce all this 50%, we could have healthier environments for the insects, healthier environments for everyone. So really think about, when you are using, when you decide to use uh, pesticides, if you really have to do it, if it's just an aesthetic thing, because sometimes you can just let them be and have still have some 
produce, so I still have some pretty flowers. So, so it's just something to keep in mind. And thank you. Thank you, Deanna. That was excellent. A uh, good summary of all the pests that could be on our plants and then some of the management techniques. We, whew, You got your work cut out for you because there were a lot of questions that came in. Um, I know that uh, you have to jump over to the next session. So I think it's probably best that we um, hold off on answering any questions until uh, we post them in the YouTube video. And um, we'll, we'll transition now to our IPM Minute. So thank you, Deanna, for your excellent Thanks. presentation. Um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker at this time um, for our IPM Minute, which takes a quick look at a timely topic and provides some action items uh, that you can take. So for this session, um, our speaker is Dr. Brian Brown. And Brian is a Senior Extension Associate with the New York State IPM Program. And his program aims to improve management of weeds while minimizing environmental, economic, and health risks associated with those management tactics. So today, Brian will speak to us about poison ivy management. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, Matt. Uh, thanks for inviting me. And uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, so poison ivy is... Uh, a real concern for uh, a lot of us uh, for a few different reasons. Most uh, most commonly, the toxic oils that that they they exude uh, that can get on our skin or on our clothes and be spread actually on our skin or on our clothes to other parts of our body or other people, and uh, can cause contact dermatitis, especially in individuals that are are very allergic to it. Um, about uh, about half of half of the population of, of people in the US are, are have some degree of immunity, which, which is lucky for them, but uh, I think most of us uh, uh, are sensitive to it. Um, if you do get it on you, you realize it, you, you, you identified it, um, and you wash with cold water as soon as possible, you can really alleviate uh, the worst effects of it. Uh, the cold water rather than warm water is so that you keep your, your pores and your skin closed um, and it it's, um, penetrates into your skin less. It can be a little bit tricky to identify as the, the shape and, and size of it can, can vary. Um, the, the leaf edges can be smooth or they can have uh, these serr serrations or notches um, and in certain times of the year, especially in the fall, it can have a reddish appearance. Uh, but the one consistent feature is that there's le leaflets of three. There's three, um, th they're not actually leaves, uh, they're, there's because there's a bud at the base of the, the petiole there on the stem, um, but they're leaflets. And, and one other um, important consideration is that all three leaflets are of similar size. Uh, I saw some just yesterday that I thought was poison ivy, but that 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 uh, central leaf was a lot bigger than the others, and and uh, so that clued me in that it wasn't. Um, the biology, so it's a perennial weed uh, and has a very extensive root system. It that's how it survives the winter through the the carbohydrate reserves in the roots. So it, it sends a lot of. Um, you know, basically sugars and, and food for it to survive the winter. Um, and so management is really predicated on attacking that root system. And you can do that in a few different ways um, it, by repeatedly cutting or, or hoeing off the top growth. You're forcing it to send up a new shoot. Every time it does that, it's drawing down resources uh, from the root system. It's depleting the root system. Um, so repeatedly cutting off the top growth uh, very carefully with, with personal protective equipment uh, is one way to go about it. Um, more effective are typically are used uh, systemic herbicides such as glyphosate or 2,4-D or triclopyr, which are available at your local home store. Um, and those actually are translocated down into the roots and attack this root system. Um, but even herbicides can take several applications over a few years to completely eradicate the plant if that's what you're interested in. So for quicker control, 
There are landscaping companies who will come in and suit up with all the PPE and actually dig out all the roots or most of them um, to really, um, really remove it. Um, there's also a couple of companies in the Northeast that use goats to, uh, to, to remove that top vegetation and eventually deplete the root system. But just be careful not to pet the goats because they'll be covered in the oils and uh, kind of uh, become kind of poison ivy-like themselves. <laughs> Um, and so just to wrap up, um, you know, if you've got poison ivy uh, in, your area, in your area, you might consider posting a warning sign uh, so folks don't go walking through it uh, by accident. Um, and if you're in a, a position where you're, you're trying to manage it, um, do take kind of a long-term approach. You know, that root system is very extensive. It can take a few years to, to deplete it. Um, or if you're in a hurry, uh, you might try to dig it out or, or contact a, uh, a, landscape a landscaping professional to dig it out. But be advised that the roots uh, also contain the oil, even in the winter. Um, so at all times of year, in all circumstances, you want to be very careful uh, with poison ivy. Um, and for more resources, do check out our, our website, um, which has uh, information on other weeds and other pests. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Brian. Um, I am one of those 50% that get poison ivy quite bad. So the cold water trick is is helpful. I use tech new and that that has worked for me as well to sort of neutralize those oils. Um, so thanks for a great presentation. Hopefully people can key in on poison ivy. I've seen a lot this year more than more than in previous years. Um, at this time, we are over our uh, time for the day. So again, we'll hold off on questions and ask Brian to fill those in um, in the video description. We wanna thank everybody for attending today and thank our two speakers for excellent presentations. And we hope that you join us for a future First Friday event. So thanks everyone and have a great weekend.